Hello everyone and welcome back to Nine Lives Season 2 Episode 19. Can't believe it man, 19. I said every season would have 20 episodes but I've booked two really special guests that I can't say no to so I think we're probably going to end on 23 I imagine around that and then for season three there's going to be some big exciting things happening <laughs> that I can't share with you yet but Nine Lives is going to be expanding and you're just going to get more great stuff because I think this podcast could do a lot more than it's doing now and could help in more ways so it's going to be great so keep an eye out for season three teasers it's going to be yeah it's going to be exciting so today's topic feels very relevant because I'm having a little bit of um professional burnout at the moment um which I won't go into because no one wants to hear me waffle on about my professional problems but it's been requested a lot that I speak about building a business curbing impulsive behaviors like impulsive spending getting out of debt being a late bloomer we've kind of surface level gone into them in season one and two but I, I wanted to dedicate an entire episode to an uncomfortable topic for a lot of people in the UK which is money and we're not going to be speaking about like I've written in my notes here don't be a shill because I think a lot of people <laughs> become successful start a business or do something well for themselves they have an online presence and then they start selling courses and <laughs> how to make money which is like the most annoying shitty thing ever don't fall for those scams everyone's circumstance is different and everyone's starting point is different and we have different leg ups and this episode is not going to be you know one of those stupid get rich quick or here's how I made my first million I'm not even you know it's not that at all this is just some advice um from someone who has overcome addiction and obesity and debt um this is just some advice we're going to talk about getting out of debt we're going to talk about the price of wellness we are going to discuss impulse control and how to develop impulse control because without impulse control you cannot start learn long-term projects and we're also going to discuss getting over the fear of starting something new which I think is probably one of the things that stops people from living out their dreams or their ideas because they're so scared of new things or what people will think of their ideas. I want to read you a passage to begin with to um, get your brain in the right state to begin thinking about these sort of things because throughout this episode I really encourage you to think about what your dreams are, your dreams financially, your dreams in business, your dream life, whether that would be buying a cottage, um, rescuing some animals and having some land. I don't know, what do people dream of? Buying a Lamborghini, <laughs> whatever it is that, you know, makes you feel like that's a good goal. Perhaps you just would like to feel well enough to go for a walk, whatever it is, keep it in your mind. So there is a spiritual teacher called Ram Das, who I recently have become very enthralled with. And I saw this saying, and it really reminded me of the concept of entrepreneurship, especially entrepreneurship for people who are mentally ill or for people who struggle with their mental health, I should say. In each of us, there was once a fire. And for some of us, there seems as if there is only ashes now. But when we dig in the ashes, we find one ember. And very gently, we fan that ember, blow on it, it gets brighter, and from that ember we rebuild the fire. The only thing that is important is that ember. That's what you and I are here to celebrate. That though we've lived our life totally involved in the world, we know that we're of the spirit. So I want you to imagine yourself as that ember. Sometimes we are a great roaring fire that sweeps through the days of our lives with great passion and intention the flame growing and lighting other ideas with it as we go. But sometimes, for some of us, that fire goes out. We lose the passion and drive we once had for life and for creating a life worth living. 
but that ember is always there waiting. In every human, no matter how downtrodden or low you feel, there is always an ember. It might lay dormant for years, extinguished by the weight of trauma or of poor mental health, but the trick is to tell yourself that it is still there. That is hope. It only has to be tiny. We can fan that ember gently until your flame relights and grows. It won't always be a great roaring forest fire, but it could just be one match, one idea, one morning of this time I'm going to try, I'm going to give myself a chance. You won't always have that fire lit, and this is really important to note. Sometimes, even in times of great success and purpose, it will just be an ember again. But the trick is to always know it's there waiting. Perhaps that is the soul. Each of our passions and unique fingerprints of forgery of ideas is different to each other. Never compare your ember to someone else's. We burn at different times, just as the flowers do not bloom all year, neither can you. Today, I want to tell you my story of finding success after years of stagnation and give you some pathways to discover your own fire and be brave enough to perhaps give yourself your own second chance. So I loved that teaching and the paragraph after it were my words, but the first was Ram Dass. To paint a picture, and I'm not going to be just talking about me, don't worry, but to paint a picture of sort of my story um, and where I was to where I am now, uh, I did not succeed at school academically. I failed sort of most classes. Um, I always failed exams. I was always failing in relationships, whether that's like friendships or romantic relationships. Um, and I got myself into really quite bad debt because uh, I didn't see a future for myself. So I thought it didn't matter if I was taking out thousands of pounds in credit cards because... I'd never have to pay them off. So my mindset was very much just, you know, what's the point of creating a future when I don't see a future? So I do things like skip class to go to the shop and drink vodka, lots of partying. Obviously, we've you've heard my story, excessive spending, you know, things that were taking me further and further away from myself and my purpose and the person I was when I was little, because when I was little, I loved writing reading, moving, creating, all the things that I do now. But I lost that in the lifestyle I was living. And it's very, very hard to see the woods from the trees when you are so involved in that sort of lifestyle. It's very, very difficult. Now I have three teams with a total of 17 people. But this process didn't happen overnight and it didn't happen easily. Um, I have nearly lost myself in the process of building these businesses a few times. Entrepreneurship is not for the faint of heart. You have so much freedom, but you also never have freedom. And that's the kind of payoff with it. Like you can create whatever it is you desire, whether that's, you know, the place you live, the income, the opportunities. It's all, you know, you can create that. You're the magician doing that, but you're a slave to it as well. So it's a give and take. And I think there's a certain kind of person who, who takes to entrepreneurship. Um, cause you have to be slightly obsessed with your purpose to do this. And it will feel at times like everything is failing, but that's usually when it all comes together. My personality type is perfectly suited. I was just pouring my addictions into the wrong thing. So if you're sitting there thinking your vices can't become virtues, you are wrong. You might just be perfectly suited to this. You are capable of so much more than you think. But the problem actually wasn't me. So I wasn't the one, you know, who was failing at everything. The problem was impulse control. And this is what I'd like to talk to you about today. So let me paint a picture. You have an idea for a project or business, you'd like to give it a go, you order a notepad online, or perhaps it's materials that you need to start this thing, this idea, or you want to study to become a personal trainer, let's say. But like always, you last a day or maybe three before you give up. You'd rather watch TV after work, it's easier and you are tired. The key is to create sticking power, long-term goals that do not provide instant gratification, but you know truly are your dream. 
If there is anything I have learned, it's that everyone will think you're crazy until they don't, until you make it. But the only person who decides if you'll make it is you. Sure, there is some very rare luck in entrepreneurship, and I know there is nepotism as well, people who um, are actors or children of actors or children of, uh, you know, famous people. I know that exists, but in real entrepreneurship, people who build things from the ground up by themselves, 99% of it is just keeping going when it sucks, when it feels like it's not working. Just like fitness, if you expect instant success, you'll never be able to stick to it. I've had the honor and privilege of meeting a lot of people in business throughout the last few years. And one of my mentors always tells me before I make big decisions or sign contracts or feel like there are big things happening in my life and I get a bit nervous, he always says, no risk, no story. And I think that's such a cool way of looking at life because all there is is risks. You just have to constantly be taking risks. Of course, don't do anything silly or anything that's going to damage your physical or mental well-being, please, or financial well-being. But little risks here and there, um, that's what creates the story and that's what's going to create your dreams. So let's talk about impulse control. If this sounds familiar, if I have one glass of wine, I will have more. The voice saying you really shouldn't shuts down and I can do anything I want to. That voice is the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, an area of the brain that handles planning, making choices and suppressing urges. It coordinates with another region in the prefrontal cortex called the orbital frontal cortex, an area involved in regulating emotions. When you encounter a potential reward, these areas of the brain do some quick math to determine whether you'd be better off going for it or putting your energy towards a bigger payoff later. So, small impulse versus big payoff. Often, One is faced with the small immediate rewards versus larger delayed rewards. Individuals who choose to wait for larger delayed rewards are typically seen as less impulsive. Uh, These are the words of Mark Potenza, MD, Associate Professor of Psychiatry. Impulsivity has two main characteristics, rapid unplanned reactions and reduced concern for the consequences of actions. Clearly, poor impulse control can have all sorts of negative effects on your life. For example, being unable to control your anger can lead to problems at work and with your family. Lack of impulse control can cause compulsive disorders such as gambling, shopping, alcohol. Uh, And it's even been linked to type 2 diabetes. You can, however, learn to control yourself better. It may be as simple as paying better attention to the voice in your prefrontal cortex. A good trick is reminding yourself, if you're beginning to go down the decision-making road, how will you feel afterwards? Trying to foster good habits in people at an early age is helpful, but it's never too late. People can change, particularly if they are motivated to change. So this idea of small impulse versus big payoff is something that's fascinating to me and especially the way that the brain reacts to both both pathways because my biggest obstacles to success and a lot of people's biggest obstacles to success that I see are drink food um debt whether that's debt to like Klarna (laughs) or uh impulsive spending online lots of you know trips to the pub those are what I see people Um, coming up against again and again and again. And those are all impulsive behaviors because not, you know, I'm not saying that all drink food and money being spent is impulsive, but we're talking about damaging. And you know, in, in your mind, you'll know, you will know when it's not a good decision to do what you're doing. So getting yourself incredibly tangled and lost and confused in these impulses and not knowing how to get out of them. And for me, it felt like I was getting in a grave and I was almost like pouring mud on myself with every decision I was making. But the hardest, hardest thing we can do is admit we are struggling because there's so much shame in debt and in secret eating, especially for me. Um, Opening up to my friends was the first step that I took. Uh, I racked up huge credit card bills because I could not control my impulse spending. 
The day I decided to address my money problems was terrifying because there is such a huge stress involved in it that looms over you like a dark cloud. I missed payments for about a year as I didn't have any money. So I set up a payment plan alongside working part-time to pay small monthly bills. It was a mountain of an amount. (laughs) I won't say how much, but it was big and it was scary. It was terrifying to me. Um, But as soon as I set up that payment plan, even though in my head at that point, I thought I'm never going to pay this off. I'll, I'll be paying these monthly payments until I die. At least I had said, I'm struggling to pay this and I need some help working out how to do this. I slept so much better when I just organized that and arranged it. It felt like I had told the truth and like I had said, actually, I'd like something to be better. You know, I don't want to just be drowning every month in these bills. So... Because I'd made that step, I started to make better financial decisions because I, in my mind, had a plan for the future of like, I know that even though it's going to take me forever, at least I know there's a plan and I know there's a long term goal of trying at least to not be in such huge debt. I might never be debt free. And that began to help with my impulse control because I had a long vision view of my future. I had made the first decision for my future there. Not long after that did I start walking every day. So those were two things I did that were massive for me because I had admitted I would like to change. I think I have a problem and I I don't have all the tools or resources or money to fix it, but I'm going to tell someone that I'd like to fix it and I'm going to admit to myself that I'd like to change. And those two things together changed my life forever, as we know. But I started to kind of stop making the rash decisions, like racking up hundreds of pounds at the pub every night on a credit card. Um, I was always the person to get the shots in because I thought it would make people like me more. You know, the classic. I was always like going over to the bar and getting huge trays of tequila and the fun one. And, you know, but I was getting myself into really, really bad financial trouble by doing that. Taxis, takeaways, clothes, the fast fashion, like I used to be completely addicted to buying really crap, which is something I'm really ashamed of because I'm now so into vintage and sustainable fashion that that really makes me cringe. But anyway, I was really, really struggling at that point. But I did used to buy really cheap clothing because I thought that it would make me feel better about myself and my body and my appearance when actually I had to look after myself and get healthy to feel better about those things. But again, that's a long term goal. And that's really hard for my brain to think about. So it was all just a plaster and it's a temporary fix. Um, I needed to get moving physically, to stay in, to save. And eventually I figured that out, but just know there is no shame in struggling. This world is fucking tough. And these temptations are such a salve from the shit we go through every day. Do not get me wrong. The reason that I fell into addiction is because I was struggling a lot with how I was feeling about myself and some things that people had done. So... Of course, I'm going to reach for a cigarette, a glass of wine, a quick fix of online shopping, you know, because it makes me feel better and it's instant. I'm not going to think, I might sign up for Paris Marathon 2024 and train for it. No, of course not. You know, it's just one step at a time, one tiny little step at a time. And this is why money and fitness and discipline with both sort of go hand in hand. And as I developed my discipline with fitness, my money hygiene became a lot better as well. Because again, you're just managing your impulse control. You're able to have a long-term view. You're able to understand that things take a lot of time. For example, now I'm off the back of two marathons. I've lost so much muscle and my body confidence right now is like really low. I'm not feeling like myself at the moment at all and I caught myself last night because I've been back in the gym for like a week and a half doing my um just like my back to it sort of build back plan and I caught myself last night looking in the mirror and being like where why after a week and a half have I not become a goddess what's going on here but no it takes a long time and that patience it's so funny because even I forget And I'm on this journey still, like I forget, oh yeah, that's going to take me three months. (laughs) Calm down, you're going to be fine. So it's just living in the journey that's so important. Um, 
But there's no point in laying out some grand plan of a business if you do not address the impulse control. Sticking power is what will win. Just as I could not begin to think of running a marathon before addressing and healing my binge eating disorder. You have to set the conditions for success for yourself, which is much harder if you have mental health struggles and addictions to overcome first. I know friends, I hear you, but you have one shot at this life and you have a beautiful, unique flame inside of yourself that the world deserves to see. So before you light that match and throw it in the furnace, make sure the room is clear and safe and you aren't going to set fire to things. Make sure you are safe to begin. So I know it can be very, very difficult to Because you get excited and you think today's the day I'm going to address my money problems. I'm going to start this business. I'm going to start the Instagram account. And I'm also going to start running, walking. Yes, very good. Wonderful. Fantastic. The things that matter the most in all of these journeys is making sure that your brain is in a place where it can control its impulses and it can see a long view and you are able to have sticking power. We've done a lot of different episodes on those topics. So if you want, you can go and listen back to those. But addressing that first is the most important thing. And this is why, and I think a lot of people, um, I suppose they'd view me as successful. I don't know. Maybe they'd, I think I've had a redemption for sure. Maybe I'm not like super successful, but I have definitely got out of a lot of bad things, right? <clears throat> and they're always asking, how did you do it? You know, what what did you do? How did you not give up? Why do you not relapse? And it's because I spent the first two years or year and a half of my journey not focusing on weight loss, not focusing on making loads of money or anything like that. I was just trying to get happy and trying to get myself to a place where I could see a future. And my brain felt like it was really on my side, you know, because for a long time, especially if you've grown up being bullied or being in mm, tricky romantic relationships where you are made to feel like you're not worth much, the inner bully inside your head that tells you you're a failure, tells you you're going to fail at things is so loud and it can be so difficult to speak over it because I often feel like I'm a tiny, tiny little child sometimes if I'm having a bad mental health day because I hear everything that's been said to me by people and things, you know, it's, and then I start feeling very, very scared. And those are the days that I find entrepreneurship the hardest because it's not natural for me to be, to have a platform or to have a loud voice or to do self-promotion. I really detest it, but it is connected to my purpose, which is helping, sharing, gathering and teaching. So It all makes sense in the end for me. But just know that it's never a straight line and you're going to have to do things that make you really uncomfortable. No risk, no story. So as of January 2023, I am officially debt free. And in September of this year, I will be four years binge free. Two things I never thought I would say out loud. So we're going to talk a little bit about money now. And I know that people find it uncomfortable to talk about And I will address that there are so many layers of socioeconomic privilege that I am acutely aware that I have. But I would still like to offer my advice as someone who has been on a recent financial journey. So I know that there are people out there who, I mean, are in positions where this conversation would feel like it didn't belong to them because, you know, they don't have the resources or the help or, you know, I'm, I'm really, really aware of that. And I know money is a really very uncomfortable topic. So let's just let these, let this advice be what it is. And I hope no one gets cross. <laughs> That's all. Um, so the cost of health, right? This is something that really stopped me when I was a student and uh, again, when I was in debt, because I always thought that I was too broke to be fit. Uh, or to make a change. Um, And I always thought, oh, that's for like the rich wellness girls, you know, Um, because it does from the outside, it looks expensive, right? Like you see them in their like matching sets and expensive Pilates studios and expensive coffees and smoothies and protein powders and supplements and like, oh my God, it's all adding up. It's so much money. And yeah, when you get to a point where 
perhaps you feel like indulging in that kind of stuff, you can have it. You don't need it. I feel my best when I'm working out from home, running in the local park, eating whole foods. Um, that's when I feel my best because that's what I did at the beginning of my journey. And so I'm going to break this kind of down in a way. Now, these figures are my figures, but they're what got me in trouble. So if we take a packet of cigarettes, right, I was smoking 20 a day, that's 3,650 pounds a year. Alcohol, one drink a night. It was absolutely not just one drink a night, so I'm being modest. One drink a night for 365 days a year is 2,520. Takeaways or junk food twice a week, which is the UK average, 5,200 pounds a year. That's 11,370 pounds a year. And again, that's being really modest. The price of dumbbells on Amazon that I bought for myself were 39 pounds. Uh, the price of running shoes that I bought for myself were 35 pounds. I didn't have a gym membership during my weight loss journey, but they range from about 20 to 50 pounds a month, depending where you live. It's a much lower expense comparatively to my old lifestyle. And I know that people will find that very hard to hear. Making things seem inaccessible is something I also used to do to convince myself I couldn't do it. Fitness is for other people. Business is for other people. Not for me. But I've said it a hundred times and I'll say it again now to remind you, extraordinary is accessible. It does belong to you. Anybody can do it. It is for all of us. I lost a hundred pounds at home with just a pair of dumbbells and walking and running in the local park. I started a business from my phone. <laughs> I began this podcast without fancy production or design. It's starting. That's the important part and building momentum. So sometimes you've got to be real with yourself. And that can be one of the most difficult things to do in the world. Because when I sat down and I first looked at my expenditure, because I'd got myself into such a hole with money and I didn't you don't know why, right? Because you don't see it all going out. And I, I, you know, I was not living lavishly. I wasn't buying designer clothes and, or going on holidays, like nothing like that. So I was like, how am I getting myself in so much trouble? And those were the figures that I came up with in my little notepad. And I was like, right, that's actually quite expensive. That is quite a lot of money. Um, and that's not including all of the impulse weird spending I was doing on Amazon as well. So when you look at how much you spend on things that are, like we spoke about earlier, the salve, the plaster, the impulsive behavior that's going to make you feel good in the short term, you are once again damaging your future financially, not to mention your health, but also financially as well. And this is an uncomfortable, this is an uncomfortable, I'm uncomfortable talking about this because I know what it feels like to be at home and feel super desperate and lost and have this and these things be the only thing that makes you feel better. Like I never want anyone to feel like I'm looking down or shouting at you about this because if you're in this position, it's okay. Like it's so easy and normal to get yourself to a place where these are the only things that make you feel better. So just don't feel any shame around it, but it's just about opening these sort of ideas and conversations in your mind with yourself about, okay, you know, and I'm also not implying that everyone needs to be sober at all. I will always say alcohol is not the problem. I'm the problem. If you can moderate it, um, or even if you want to have a couple big nights out a month, it's not, a, you know, that's absolutely fine. It's just when it gets to a point where say you have a goal of, um, you know, you, you wanted to start a part-time business selling your paintings on Etsy or, um, yeah, let's say paintings. You need an investment into yourself of £300 for materials. That £300 could come from maybe like a month of cutting down on booze or two months, you know, um, getting the materials and getting set up online and starting to post your work and building momentum that way. Of course, it, that sounds like, right, okay, it's easier said than done. And yes, that's completely right. But, but, but sometimes it is that easy. I think as well, we complicated in our minds of, right, I've got to do this. I've got to set up a limited company. Then I've got to find this person to, to do this and that and that. I am such a firm believer and lover of just throw it out there. Throw your 
self out there and into it and just see what happens. I think it's the best way of doing things. And then you'll know you're not investing too much in something that doesn't work, right? Like I've said it, but this podcast, I had no idea what I was doing when I came here and the momentum has just built it to where it is now. And and I have the privilege of giving you these ideas every week, but that wouldn't have happened had I not have just come in and tried and just said, right, well, you know what? I'm scared, but I could have done it anyway. But admitting you want something is scary because it's admitting that you lack something. In the episode, in an episode in an earlier season, or no, this season, in a previous episode, we spoke about shadow work uh, and we discussed at length the part of owning those sort of darker parts of yourself. Um, And it can be really scary to say, I want more for my life because you're admitting that your life isn't where you want it to be. And that's painful. That's really painful. I've had a few conversations recently with family and friends where, you know, my life is currently not where I want it to be, um, just in some balance of some things. And it's so upsetting to say that, you know, I want something, which means I lack something. And it's it's very, very, very hard to say that. So don't be surprised if this is also an emotional journey because um, it's terrifying. <laughs> But what is life without being scared, you know? Um, But again, fear does not prevent death. It prevents life. So people are always scared to do things, but fear is what makes life happen. It's, It's That's the adventures. That's, you know, that's where the, the growth, the growth is. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about being scared of success and others' opinions of you. Uh, from the words of a psychologist called Keith Rolag. I'm going to give you some tools around this as well, don't worry. So no matter what new skill it is you're trying to pick up, you probably won't have a blast in the beginning. In fact, we're wired to be wary of new experiences. From an evolutionary standpoint, trying new things for much of human history could have been very dangerous. Your performance can have such a big impact on your status. In turn, it affects our ability to get the resources we need. From our far back ancestors, not looking dumb was an issue of survival. All of which means that deep in our brains, there's a primeval fear of looking bad, a fear of not performing as well as others. One of the challenges with new hobbies is the fact that you're meeting new people, new groups, new experiences, and that triggers a lot of anxiety we have around being the newcomer. In other words, not loving it right away isn't a sign that you've made a terrible terrible mistake. It's part of being human. Enjoyment will come as the newness fades. So here's some tips to round off the episode of how to get over the fear of starting something new and the fear of what people think of you. Number one, remember no one is paying attention to you. You might have heard of the spotlight effect, our tendency to believe that all eyes are on us when in reality no one is paying attention. If you're feeling self-conscious, the spotlight effect can be a handy reality check. If you're on the ski slope, most people aren't looking for the beginners to laugh at them and evaluate them. They're just going down the mountain. If that's not enough to ease your jitters, try thinking through the logic of it. In order to truly humiliate yourself in front of other people, those other people have to actually be watching you. And that's just the first step. People have to notice your performance. They have to know it's bad. They have to care about it. And then they have to do something about it, like openly laughing or pointing you out to other people or turn the tables around. Say you're a runner, for example. How often when you're out on a run, do you get out of your own head enough to notice and judge some stranger who's huffing and puffing as they jog by? Never, right? That's everybody else too. That's This is my favorite example because I never in my life have perceived a beginner runner in a negative, nor do I ever really perceive runners while I'm out running. I don't think so. If I recognize them from like local run clubs, I'll, you know, I give them a high five or whatever, but I don't, I think people are so in their own worlds because you are so in your own world. So imagine everyone else is too. Like it's, it's a beautiful thing to have the freedom to be, well, cringe, to try something new and just realize that it's all just our experience. People care so much less about us than we think. So number two, go in with the right mindset. People tend to approach a new skill in one or 
one of two ways. Some go in wanting to learn it, while others go in wanting to master it. It seems like a subtle difference, but it matters. I know I don't really know how to do this. I'm going to make mistakes, but the fun in this is sort of figuring out how to do it. While the latter is, it's all about doing well, impressing others, discovering your natural talent in something. Going in with the humility of the learning approach allows you to enjoy yourself even as you're floundering. After all, that's just part of the process. Gunning for mastery, on the other hand, sets you up for failure pretty quickly. So I've said it a million times, but it's all about the journey, isn't it? And knowing that you've got to be good as at being a beginner is the most beautiful thing ever. It can help to think carefully about the end goal or what it should be to start with a beginner friendly one. Maybe your new hobby is marathons, <laughs> for example. Running one in under four hours is the goal, sure, but getting in shape and meeting other runners are worthy outcomes too. Number three, prepare before you start. Taking the learning approach also doesn't mean you have to go in blind. Whatever you're trying, do a little prep work beforehand can make your first time a lot less intimidating. So this was something I did a lot in lockdown. I became really obsessed with powerlifters and female powerlifters. And I started to uh, read a lot of their books. I started to become quite involved in like watching them on YouTube and slowly that way I kind of learned the lingo I saw what it was like to do a deadlift I was watching them do their barbell overhead presses and I'd never done any of these things before but I, I kind of felt like I knew what they were talking about I knew what the motion was I knew what the culture was so just by doing that it made me less nervous the first time I went to a gym um which was I mean a year two years into my journey <laughs> But I already felt like I belonged in the gym because I'd had so much reading and knowledge and kind of immersing myself into the culture of it all uh, beforehand. To the extent that people can rehearse things, it's almost as if they've partly done it. So the more you can reduce those emotions and those feelings of anxiety, the more likely that somebody will have a good experience. For example, if you want to try your hand at baking, before you actually burst out the kitchen equipment, maybe watch a few YouTube tutorials and a few minutes to look up the terms you don't understand. If you're taking up golf, it's fine to read a book on the sport before you go to the driving range. A baseline of knowledge will help you feel a little bit better about the first time you try swinging a club. So I hope those little tidbits help you. I understand this is a broad and very nuanced topic and that's why I did struggle with preparing for this one because obviously my journey is very individual to me and came with a very individual set of quite extraordinary circumstances in the way that my timing was very right with starting an online platform but also the journey that I've had is a story to tell and we all have a story to tell and I think storytelling is the greatest tool you could have in any business. People love stories, people love people, people love people man, like just if you can be as real and yourself um, and vulnerable as possible in modern day business I think that's probably probably the biggest power you can have, you know. Um, I know, especially, I, you know, I would never in, in invest or indulge in any business where I didn't think it was aligned with me and my beliefs and my purpose. So it's all about finding your tribe, isn't it? Like you guys listen to Nine Lives because perhaps you find it, it's a little bit of a different way of thinking about life or fitness that perhaps you don't vibe with other people or people won't vibe with this podcast and they want like the cold, hard facts about you know, how to run a sub two hour marathon, sub two hour, <laughs> okay, Olympic world record. Um, you know what I mean? It's, it's, everyone has their little pockets of the world. And I think I mentioned it briefly earlier in the episode, but don't be afraid to have your own goals that are different to what you see online. You call the shots. Um, one of the hardest parts is stepping into your power as well, like coming from being a a people pleaser, it can be very difficult to then hire and fire and all the things that come with being a boss. It's very, very difficult. Um, and again, I'm still learning. I'm still learning. And, uh, you know, I can do specific episodes 
<clears throat> and I would actually like to get into this topic with a couple of guests coming up in the next few weeks because they are also women in business. Um, uh, you know, there's a lot, there's so much to go into, but I do hope that those two things, I just, I wanted to go, I wanted to talk about impulse control and fear uh, of starting something new because I think those are the two precursors to then, right, now we're starting the business and then perhaps I could do an episode on what happens then, <laughs> you know, how do we set KPIs? How do we grow an Instagram? How do you build a team? You know, how do you take time off? Like all, you know, all the things that entrepreneurs struggle with. So perhaps this will be in two parts. There we go. We've, we've worked it out. Thank you for listening, everyone. I hope you find your ember and I hope you feel empowered to fan it into a flame. The fire we have inside all of us, let it burn bright. So, I found this passage, um, I was going to, I've been writing poetry, I was going to read my own poem, but I'm too shy, maybe I'll do that at the last episode of this season, because I've been dabbling, but I'm embarrassed, um, yeah, look forward to that. Anyway, this is a passage, it is nameless, but if every, anyone knows, please do let me know, it's, uh, I just found it on Pinterest, and I absolutely loved it. Does the sun ask itself, am I good? Am I worthwhile? Is there enough of me? No. It burns and it shines. Does the sun ask itself, what does the moon think of me? How does Mars feel about me today? No, it burns and shines. Does the sun ask itself, am I as big as other suns in other galaxies? No, it burns and shines. Beautiful. All right, I hope that was helpful. As always, all my love, I would love to hear your feedback on this episode. Um... I will catch you next week and loads of love. <laughs>